Okay, three, two, one. We think the world would be a better place if it actually did take a village to raise a child. I want to highlight right from the very outset that this is a prefers a world debate, which means it's not about going forward from the present moment in time, if this was the case. It's about an entire alternate history in which mankind and humanity as a whole raised their children in this particular format. What does this particularly look like? We think this looks like how many tribal communities continue to raise their children today, where the entire community has a sense that they have a particular obligation to help raise each individual child, regardless of the specific biological material that formed that child. They see that child as a child of the whole community, not of two specific individuals. This means they have an obligation to help out those uh, children and to provide assistance to the parents when it is necessary. In a low case, it just looks like looking after the child when they're busy. In a higher form, it looks like giving the child advice about what they want their life to be like, being there to help them through difficult spots in time, give them emotional support. Basically, anything that a parent could do for a child, this world is one in which the community feels like it has an obligation to help out those children, even if they don't share their biological material. Three arguments from opening government. First, how it improves children's quality of life. Secondly, how it makes raising children easier and why that is better for parents. And thirdly, how this helps break down harmful gender norms. Are there any points of clarification at the start? Yeah, I'm genuinely unclear what you think the difference between this world and the other world is. Like people ask people for advice all the time. What yeah, yeah, no, hold on. Hold, yeah, yeah. Yes, but we're in a far more individualized world in which individuals do not feel like they're under an obligation to assist other children, in which parents don't feel like that's the case, which parents feel like they have a particular level of special ownership over their children in a way that is distinct, and which children see their main court of recourse as their parents rather than anything else. Uh, so there is a categorical distinction between these worlds. Uh, so let's start with the children's quality of life. I wanna first note that in our world, abuse from the parent is far less likely or it's far more likely to be caught. Why is that the case? Because often abuse is able to take place because it is hidden. You isolate that child away from other individuals where no one can see the bruises, no one can see the pain, and where the child will never tell anyone about it because they do not feel like they are close enough with the members of the community for that to be the case. We think it is far more likely that abuse is going to be caught on our side of the house when the entire community has a parental stake with that child, when the child feels like they have a greater level of trust in the community as a whole. And I think that is already enough of a benefit to win us this debate. The fact that we are able to prevent individuals from engaging in the most horrific, horrible behavior to some of the most vulnerable members of society, I think is already enough. I want to make another point on this as well, which is that abuse often takes place because of a particular concept of ownership that parents have over their child, that this child is theirs, that it is their property in other words, that they have a particular claim on this child that lets them do whatever they want to this child, regardless of the quality of life horror that, that will inflict upon that. We think a world in which this ownership stake in that child is comparatively lessened because that child belongs to the community rather than just this particular individual is one in which the psychics that lead to abuse is less likely to be the case. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is how we improve the self-actualization and broader quality of life of the child. We think that our world is one in which children have access to more individuals to get advice about their life as role models about what they potentially want to be. They have more individuals who they have an emotional connection to as a pseudo-parental figure. Why is this beneficial? I think this is beneficial because it means that children will have a greater diversity of options and mechanisms to achieve what they want in life. What does this look like? It means that if you are a child, you have more individuals to mold yourself after, where you can better self-actualize what you actually want to be, rather than often in the status quo, individuals molding themselves exclusively off of their core parental figure, which is their parents, which limits what that child can be in the long run. But moreover, for children who have desires that differ potentially from the desires of their parents, they're often handicapped in their ability to achieve those goals because they don't feel like they can reach out to individuals who could offer them advice about how they can best achieve that end outcome. And here is where I also respond to Farrell's POI because potentially you could in a theoretical world ask advice, but the question is whether individuals would give that advice and whether you would feel comfortable either reaching out for it in the first place. And this is unlikely to be the case because in the status quo, individuals often feel that this child from somebody else is competing with their particular child for life success. And because you do not feel like you have a particular stake in that other child's success as well, even if they're a member of your community, you're less likely to give them advice if you see that as potentially competing against your child. Furthermore, parents are more likely to actively coerce their children to follow a particular path in life on the opposition side of the house. And that's because of the ownership stake that you have in your child. You believe that your child is a particular reflection on you on opposition side of the house, rather than being a reflection on the community as a whole, which means that you often want them to follow the particular course in life that you believe is best. You 
often want to live through your child through this particular mechanism. Uh, closing opposition. Yeah, in terms of asking for advice, uh, there are teachers, guidance counselors, like coaches, like why do you need someone to act as your parent other than your biological parents look, look, to get advice from them? I think in a significant number of cases, you need individuals who you can feel that you can adequately trust. And in key formative years, individuals often feel they have a disproportionate level of trust exclusively for their parents above and beyond everybody else. And that often there limits their ability to get advice even once they reach environments where that advice could potentially be offered. And I think this then tracks individuals through the long term. Now, I want to move on to the uh, next part of this improvement claim, which is why you're more likely to be able to have significant levels of emotional trust and support. We think that in a significant number of cases, when individuals lack parental supervision, when their parents aren't around, when their parents are busy, and there aren't other individuals who they can turn to in the community, this often harms them. Firstly, it just means they're more likely to get into situations that are unfortunate, right? They're more likely to be accidents if you have children that aren't adequately under parental supervision. But we think that also an absence of emotional support can often be harmful for a child's development. Next, on the second argument about making it easier to raise a child. I think it is just significantly easier to raise a child when you are having easier time getting support from individuals in your community to look after your child in your otherwise busy life. I think this often particularly helps individuals who are poor, who often don't have the money to afford expensive childcare procedures. And what this often means is that a community can band together to allow individuals to be financially successful while still being able to raise a child. And this is where it's going to lead into the third claim about the breaking down of gender norms as well. We think that gender norms historically were often based on the fact that if you had a significant number of children, you needed someone to be able to look after those children for a significant period of time. And that often ended up being the woman. But a world in which the community can come together to raise the child decreases the burden on the specific parental unit to look after their children in all periods in time, which removes a particular hurdle that has existed historically for women accessing the workforce and being able to have a certain level of financial prosperity and independence. And look, we're not imagining this is going to be a utopia, but it's at least the removal of a significant burden, which meant that women's liberation is likely to have occurred earlier on our side of the house than it is on opposition. To conclude this speech, I think it is the case that the world would be better off if villages raised children in which you had the entire community invested in that child's upbringing. Proud to propose. Thank you for that excellent speech, leader of opposition. The floor is now yours. You're here. Great, for POIs, please exclusively ask them in the chat. I'm gonna be talking about three things in this speech. Firstly, the parent-child relationship. Secondly, which kids get left behind. And then finally, on social change. On the parent-child relationship, and I wanna note that everything that I'm going to say in this argument also applies to notions of having close emotional ties with your siblings, given that you're probably gonna spend a greater quantity of time with them within the family unit. The reason that the parent-child relationship is better under our side of a house is that you end up spending a far longer period of time with a single set of parents. In a world with communal parenting, time inherently becomes more divisible across a far higher number of people. Yes, you will have relationships, but you're not gonna have a relationship where every single day you come home from school and you confide to your parents about the kind of things they were ultimately experiencing. What spending a greater quantity of time with a single set of parents does is you end up knowing each other a lot more intimately because you were just interacting at so many junctures of your life. These are the same people who literally knew you since you were born. You live in a household with them. And there's also like the social expectation that you're often confiding to a relatively large extent within a single set of people. This ends up then doing a couple things. Firstly, you end up getting stronger relationships because you become more attentive to one another's emotional needs. That is to say, when you spend just a greater quantity of time talking to one another, you end up knowing the kind of things that make each other tick. You see what annoys people when it comes to things like conflict resolution. You know when someone else might be emotionally sensitive. So if you know that like your kid is being bullied at school because you spend a greater quantity of time talking to them, you're gonna be extra sensitive on those kinds of particular days. So when you just know each other a lot better, it allows you to know each other's triggers, to know each other's insecurities, and to know when other people gravely need love that you're then able able to reciprocally fulfill. Secondly, though, I think that kids in particular feel a lot more comfortable confiding information within their parents when they just know each other better, when they have that kind of intimate emotional connection. That is, when, they, when, when, when it isn't the first time you have to be emotionally vulnerable in front of someone, when that person has given you support in the past, when you feel like someone else truly knows you, you're going to feel a lot more likely to actually use that individual as some kind of emotional support network. The conflicting frame that we get coming from the PM is awe, but a lot of people suffer terrible abuse in the context of their family, and this relationship is something that is that, that is exclusive. But I think that their claim about abuse is something that is a lot more marginal in 
nature. I think that for both biological reasons, just when you get to know someone, a lot of people just do end up loving their kids. And particularly, abuse is something that we weed out under the status quo empirically in a world without communal parenting. In a world where the child-parent bond is seen as something that is being important, I think that this actually increases the impetus to weed out forms of abuse because you are seen as failing in terms of what the parental archetype is supposed to be, which is why we do have things like child protection services and the broad norm that if your parents are ultimately being abusive, you can reach out for community help. For impact this, let's take a POI from closing. Um, so this point on trust seems to kind of be not dealing with the first part of the motion, which is that if this were the if this were the world that we lived in, then children would probably have a yes, lower so threshold for trusting Our argument is not about social norms. Our argument is literally about the quantity of time that you spend with someone, which then exists independently of how socialization ultimately operates. I think that the parent-child relationship should be weighed highly, highly in this round because I think it's very important for people with both their parents and their siblings who are also going to spend a greater quantity of time with, have someone who they feel like they can confide in because family often tends to be a much greater constant than like the fickleness of friends who often ebb and flow throughout our life. Second claim, why do I think which kids are going to be left behind in a world where communal parenting ultimately exists. I think that the problem under their side of a house is that community-based norms end up dictating the kind of individuals who are able to acquire access to resources. These are likely to be exclusive for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because resources are increasingly community-based in nature, arguments about who gets increased quantity of help are often going to be utilitarian in nature. That is, who is going to be the smartest and give back more to like the community in the long term, given that there's going to probably be things like an increase of economic resources from the family to the community in order to get the prop model to basically work. I think that secondly, they're often just things like broad-based community norms. So i.e. if being a racial minority or having a disability is stigmatized, those norms become a lot more powerful when it's no longer like your parents raising you, but it's not the community doing that. I think then that three groups of people end up getting left behind. Firstly, people with neurodivergence in forms of learning disabilities. Secondly, racial minorities. Um, and thirdly, just like poor kids um, who are seen as needing more resources in order to get on the same kind of social standing as other people within that community overall. What that counterfactual looks like are high levels of parental investment within their own kids. Number one, because there's often genuine feelings of love and care that end up occurring when you just know someone a lot more intimately. But number two, they're also just self-interested reasons to like prioritize the success of your own child, such that they're going to do things like give back to you in particular as parents within the long term. So this one leads to two things. Firstly, kids on the margin are likely to be treated substantially, substantially worse. You have neurodivergence or racial minorities. Imagine like a black kid being raised in the community by a majority white community in like the Jim Crow era. I think that this is terrible. I think that you're going to experience forms of emotional ne neglect. You're going to be given less opportunities by virtue of your race. I want to know that even if this claim seems marginal, because it's like only people who have X particular trait, a lot of people are experience forms of marginalization in some dimension of their life. So it does end up applying to a lot of people. But I think that the second impact of this claim is that it's likely to reify power hierarchies within society increasingly more. That is, if white kids end up getting an increased quantity of attention, what that means is that these people are given the most opportunities for success and they're more likely to lead that community in the long term, whereas under our side of the house, even if certain families have less resources, concentrating that into a single child is likely to break down these cycles in the long term. Before we get into our final claim, we'll take another CGPOI. Cool, I gave CG another opportunity to engage, they did not. Um, final argument, let's then talk about forms of social change and power dynamics. I think that their world is likely to reify pre-existing social views that exist at a particular point in time in a way that is actively harmful. You end up getting forms of indoctrination with community-based ideologies. This ends up happening for two key reasons. Firstly, socialization is something that is quite uniform in nature. That is to say, everyone is basically being socialized by some kind of like community structure at a particular point in time. And you know, even if they try and be like, oh, you were like interacting with a bunch of different parents or like a bunch of different people, it's still broadly when you still have to do things like get filled filtration through like the education system, you're catering to the lowest common denominator in some kind of way. But I think that secondly, like deviation from broad based ideologies as a child might result in forms of like loss of resources. So that is to say, if you're seen as being like an outcast or, dis or disagreeing with the mainstream social view, there could be forms of retribution, the sense of less attention from, from your community at large. The counterfactual tends to be parents ideologically indoctrinating your children as the PM concedes in ways that are far more diverse in nature when it comes to things like notions of morality morality and character. I think that their world is uniquely problematic because who ends up leading community and establishing norms tend to be those that are uniquely privileged and patriarchal. Number one, who is seen as having the most forms of innate genius, but number two, who has economic resources who like led the community the most, historically that tended to be men and privileged stakeholders. Whereas on the counterfactual, parents often have far more intersectional worldviews. What this means then is I think that ideas of gender 
and racial equality that, that have increasingly emerged, we're due a lot more to parents indoctrinating this rather than the most privileged actors who for structural reasons are likely to lead these communities. For all of these reasons, I'm very proud to stand in opening opposition. Thank you for that fine speech, DPM. The floor is yours whenever you're ready. Here, here. Am I audible? Loud and clear. Cool. Two new substantives in the speech. One, why we build a much more communitarian society. Second, why marginalized groups of kids are better. Before that, several points of response. First, if Naomi had bothered to take the second POI as we offered four times, we would have actually answered the question they had about what makes it so different and why you get very special care on our side. The first is that there are a number of norms that mean that your parent is the only one that you are likely to go to in a number of instances. People like teachers and guidance counselors are just fulfilling a job. They often don't want to be there. They think they're being burdened and don't answer these questions. Second, in many instances, even though these advice is theoretically available, competition between kids means that your parent is usually the only one who is able to give you advice. Thirdly, all their stuff about the harms are not only symmetric, but are pushed to the extreme extreme on their side because investment in your own kid means you push them to the extreme. They are the continuation of your family line, so they must get into the top colleges. They got to pursue this career. They have to become the most normal person in that society so they can fit in, and that means their family gets more reputation among their parents. More direct refutation. Their first argument is the parent-child relationship is better. Their first mechanism is you spend more time with your parents and therefore you build trust. I have three responses to this. One, no, you're not imagining the world this works. This is a world where people believe they can be close to everyone. I want to be very clear. Strength of relationships is often built on a belief in how strong that relationship is. An example of this is even if I spend lots of time with my mother, if I don't believe that that relationship is strong because we've had falling outs or disagreements, it doesn't matter that we spent time together. A norm in which you have a strong relationship with everyone, a belief in that norm creates a perpetuating cycle where spending time with that people means you get more time with them. But second, you still have access to different people, right? Just because everyone has an obligation to take care of you doesn't mean you have an equal obligation to seek out everyone for advice. This is critical in Trenton's speech that doesn't responded to. There's an asymmetric obligation that this burden places. Everyone in society has an obligation to care for that child if this is the norm, but the child doesn't have an obligation to actively go out and meet with everyone. They can so choose to if they require their help. So you can build relatively stronger and weaker bonds with people. The increased optionality means you get more strong bonds, not that you lose everything. Thirdly, this presumes that everyone is benevolent. Many people are not benevolent. Many people take advantage of this parent-child relationship by saying, I love you, you have to listen to me, and that is a large reason children tolerate abuse because it is a conception that their parents tell them that they're doing this because they love them and this is the best way they can do it. I think this is very common in many families where parents will hit their children and say, I only do this because I love you and this will teach you how to be a better child. The second time is you spend more time with them and you can talk to them more. There's a few problems with this. One, this is often a really bad thing because if you only talk to that parent, you are unlikely to get access to resources and benefits that diverge from that viewpoint. This is particularly harmful. But second, often you fail to do this. If you have a connection with one specific individual, you often fail to tell them really important important or embarrassing things that happen to you because you feel like you'll lose credence in your eyes. Think about an embarrassing event that happens to you that you really need advice on, but you're not willing to tell your mom or dad because you think that will make them look down on you more in post punishment. I think this is a classic example we can all relate to where we would rather speak to an uncle or an aunt or a distant relative than our immediate family members because of the level of credence we place with them. We take that effect and amplify it to the max where you can still have stronger linkages with people that you talk to, but in instances where you don't feel comfortable talking to them, you have a far wider array of individuals to go to and realize that the norm in this society is that you talk to those individuals as well over time and they're willing to help you out. Thirdly, they say they weed out abuse. We're not failing this in science school. This is a completely assertive and extremely Western centric. The first thing I would point out is many countries don't have child protective services. And even when they do have them, many children don't call them on their parents for a variety of reasons. The first reason is as Trenton outlined, there is a conception in societies that parents own their children. If you go to India, for instance, people will say, we don't talk about that child or we're not gonna interfere with that family person because it is a family matter. It is something to figure out internally. It's something that we can't get involved in. And that is important because these are instances where you're unwilling to step in. But secondly, you don't call out individuals at all because your conception of normality is framed from your parent. What you eat as a child is what you consider as normal. How you're treated as a child is what you consider as normal. So if your parent tells you this is normal, don't go to other people. I'm only hitting you because I love you. These mechanisms don't work at all. Third, secondly, abuse is often emotional in many instances that Trenton outlined that got no response. Secondly, they talk about social resources. The first thing they say is that norms have a lot more effects. Uh, I, I think this is actually we're going to flip this argument right now. Things like norms have much stronger effects on their side. Why? Because you have to you have to deal with other individuals. Before that, I'll take a POI from OO. 
So when it comes to things like abuse, your family can also gaslight you in unique ways for sure your, your community can by saying things like, I'm the one in this community who loves you most. Look at all these other kids who also love me. And then cycles of abuse can still continue. The, the problem is a question of belief, right? You are more likely to believe that when they're the single source of parental as well. But often the abuse doesn't happen to begin with because you're more scared of getting caught. We affect the solution in two dynamic ways. The second is norms. Often norms are powerful because there is not communal raising of kids. Imagine it this way. You're a family who has a child that is competing with all other families and children in that society. That is where there is the greatest pressure to follow the societal norm because you want your child to be the most successful. And the way you make that most successful is to follow the norm. There's a collective action problem where you don't want to be the parent that takes care of the different child because that child is unlikely to be successful. This is rooted in conceptions about ruining your familial honor. And therefore, because it will ruin your familial honor, you disown that child, you engage in, uh, you, you take them out of your society. This is what, hap what happens on the comparative. When you raise them communally, what happens is that there's no expectation of socialization because there's no not as much competition between kids in the eyes of parents. When there's not as much competition between kids in the eyes of parents, there is no race to the median because the race to the median is only important when you have to, when, when you have to compete with other individuals. Is there a POI from CO? Nothing, moving on. Lastly, on socialization. I, I, I've just dealt with this, right? The reason socialization happens is, okay, oh, I'll go for it. So given that communities want to try to do this in efficient ways, they often need to try and have common based social services, meaning that all kids are exposed to very similar ideologies. How do you expect? No, no, I, okay, I got this. They're exposed to similar services like schools and people, but obviously parents are different. And the only reason your conception of a common ideology exists is because there's competition between kids in the status quo and parents race to the median so that their kid comes out on top because they want them to be the most normal. When there's communal raising, you aren't fear, you don't fear you being outed because you're child fail the societal standards, society is much more likely to be accepting because there's no individual burden on one kid to be representative of that family as being normal in that society. This deals with all their rebuttal. I just want to note that a lot of the stuff that Trenton talked about in terms of quality of life, self-actualization, and gender norms isn't responded to. You can't just say your case implicitly responds to it. New me mechanism, why you build a much more communitarian society. There are two problems in status quo. Firstly, there's a strong sense of specifically familial tribalism. You seek to engage in resource protection for the purpose of supporting yourself and your family. Second, this is fueled by a collective action problem where giving resources disadvantages you for collective gain. What do we overcome to solve this? When you are raising children communally, there's no sense of familial tribalism that you have to protect your resources for that one specific child. There's no sense of collective action problem because there's a norm that you have to invest in the community as a whole. This makes it much better for children because all children, people like orphans who don't have parents, people who have poorer parents, get much better access to resources and schools because there's a familial connection. That's why we also help marginalized groups of people. That means you get people like orphans getting taken care of, people in marginalized communities as I talked about. Propose. Thank you for that fine speech. DLO, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Here, here. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Excellent. Uh, I'll take POS in the chat as well, um, or people can just like turn on their cameras, but no verbal, please. Um, just one second. I'm going to start by clarifying their argument on abuse. There are three things to say here. Firstly, this is a massive, massive minority of cases. Secondly, and more importantly, you needed on their side to meet a critical threshold of trust with other people. If you believe that the clash about trust falls to our side of the house, then presumably people are not going to come forward with their abuse in any case. Thirdly, communities often like to cover up things that happen within their community. It would be bad if you do not value abuse and think it is terrible for your community and your communitarian group to come out as abusers. So presumably there's going to be significant cover-ups as exist in communitarian regions in the status quo. But fourthly, abuse is often socially valued in the very cases that Bobby talks about. What this suggests to us is that it's unlikely that people are going to shun abuse in those regions where it's most common. And so the delta of abuse is actually what, in, in like the more developed countries uh, where that is typically shunned. Therefore, typically, there's not going to be much change there. That's out of the round. Then on women and feminism, we just suggest that largely the division of labor is going to, on the margins, get much better on our side of the house. Because currently, the burden of raising a child is quite large and it falls wholly on the family. This makes it incredibly difficult to offshoot it to just one person because that one person can't possibly have the resources. But additionally, people want to form close ties with their kids in the first place. There are significant narratives within the status quo, for example, saying things like men ought to form uh, close relationships with their child because that is a manly thing to do. It is good to be a good father, for example. But broadly, the reason for this is because it's really, really difficult to not democratize the labor in a familiar unit. It's two people doing the massive task of caring for a child. And so as society has realized this and progressed, they've realized that 
it is literally impossible to offshoot all of those burdens that exist with a child onto one person. But look to the counterfactual world, where it is still likely to be the case that women are seen as better at forming things like sort of emotional labor. Because like biologically, they gave birth to the child. They have certain hormones during pregnancy, for example, that hardwires them in that instance to care uh, more for that child in the moment. And so it's still likely that like at the advent, in the original position or whatever, the society, there's still going to be significant narratives about that. But it's a lot easier to offshoot that emotional labor onto other women now, because you can't just say, look, you're the father, you should do this work, you're a part of this family too, you can say, well, there's other women within society who can take on those communal obligations. Now, uh, government responds to this by saying, ah, but you know, at least it's a much smaller like margin for each person. Like it's a community thing. So, you know, you don't have as much of a burden as an everyday uh, citizen. The issue with this is twofold though. One, emotional burdens are massive regardless of whether or not they're small. For example, the idea that a child comes to you with a mental health crisis and you as a woman have to deal with that because no men is taken. But secondly, and more importantly, there are many, many children in a society. So there are still going to be very, very high communal obligations. It means women are not going to be able to go and get jobs, for example, because they have to take care of children much more trauma. And obviously, as Trenton can see as well. This is not going to be like the hugest change in the world. Obviously, there's still going to be significant sexism on either side, but on the margins, you're much more likely to get better democratization of services on our side than on theirs, where you push, for example, women to do all of the work, whereas we have the family unit. I'll take uh, OG first. Yeah, the incredibly high burdens mean that you need someone who is completely not working on your side of the house to be able to look after the children. If the comparative uh, burden of looking after is lower. I understand. I, I just responded to that. I, I even predicted that, that was going to be a response and it gave two things to say, like emotional burdens are very high and two, there are a lot of children in society and so the burdens are still going to be quite large. Like those are two things I already said in response to that. So the suggestion of this then is that on our side of the house, many, many, many women are gained a better quality of life. Secondly then, on the issue of children, they say that children need someone that you can look uh, look up to and you know you can talk about. I want to flip this claim, claim firstly. In instances in which parents are terrible and when parents fail, the alternative is likely that children eventually opt to become more communal. So in instances in the worst case scenarios for ISAR, where parents are emotionally and physically abusive, for example, children are likely to do things like opt into relationships with their, the parents of their family members. They're likely to go to their guidance counselors at school. They're likely to opt into those relationships, even in a world that is not by default communal on our side of the house. This is important because it significantly mitigates the harm from the prop case. Because if it is a case that, and sure, this isn't going to be perfect. It's not the case that you can always perfectly opt into other relationships, but it is the case that over time, even in a non-communal world, you can eventually build those relationships up. This significantly mitigates the harm from prop, but it does nothing to the claims coming out of opposition, because the default is still that you're able to form that close emotional bond with your parent. However, on their side of the house, or on our side of the house at least, we can co-opt many of their benefits in our worst case, while still maintaining the benefits in our best case. Bobby has a couple of things to say about Naomi's argument on trust. They say, firstly, that, well, you can, you know, you, you can kind of be close with everyone. You just need to believe. Like, it's hard to believe this, right? It's hard to believe this when you don't know a single thing about your family member for for example, because you don't talk to them enough, when you don't know those like small stories that your parents tell you at the dinner table because you're never home for dinner because you're at someone else's house, when you never know, for example, your, your brother, and so you can't play board games with them and relate to them because you literally don't understand a thing about them. As you do not understand and deeply connect with a person, you can't simply like will it into existence that you have relationships with someone because that's incredibly, incredibly difficult to believe when you haven't built that up over a long period of history, when you haven't had those memories together, those laughing times, those cries in the basement, for example. You can't have any of that sort deep emotional connection on their side of the house because the prerequisite was time. Then they say, ah, but you don't have to go with everyone. You know, you can opt into relationships. This is wrong for two reasons. Firstly, because you often opt, can't opt into these things when you're quite young and developing your relationships. Like parents, you don't get to choose who gives you childcare, your parents do. But secondly, in a world that is more communal, parents are going to want to do less of the emotional labor. And so you'll be pushed to go to other sources to find that emotional labor implicitly by the fact that others don't want to do so. CG, go for it, please. So to clarify, you set up that there are harmful social norms on both sides, but your solution is that parents have diverging ideologies. Can you just explain the link work as to how this leads to the conclusion that these norms get weaker? The comparison point is really, really important because you say in abstract, parents have certain ideologies. And this is probably true. Like it is probably true that parents sometimes have harmful ideologies, but the comparison point was a society that was a much more likely to be socially con uh, concentrated. I.e. there's forms of community based, for example, um, like power dynamics that exist in many, many societies as Naomi flagged and Bobby didn't respond to. It was important to note that, for example, in many uh, regions, like there's a very, very small minority of say white individuals who control and monopolize ideology, who teach and, and control who gets taught things in schools, for example, what the syllabi look like. Like those are the people who control the ideology ideology on their side of the house. Sure, parents aren't going to be perfect, but at very least you have some sort of 
divergent perspective from the overall societal norm, right? So sure, you can opt into hearing what your parents say, and in most cases, children will, but you can also have the other perspective of society that still exists. You just default to that on, our, on their side of the house, or you don't default that to that on ours. Then they say that, you know, sometimes we don't want to meet our family members. Look, maybe that is true. Maybe it is a case that in some cases, there are really terrible families that do not work whatsoever. But as Naomi flagged, over time, you often relate to that person. You often get to know that person much better because children or parents aren't these like privacy hungry, like trying to like control all of their children's lives in the vast majority of cases. You often have children because you want to relate to someone deeply. You want to give someone a better quality of life than you had growing up. And so you don't often want to control every aspect of their life. You want to give that person a good quality of life that needs to have trust. You're very proud to have us. Thank you for that fine speech. That brings us to the end of the opening half of the debate. Member government, the floor is yours when you're ready, share here. Hi, am I audible? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, I guess before I start, content warning, I'll be talking about abuse and families, of course, and stuff like that, and uh, how that deals with like minorities. Okay, great. Uh, POIs um, through chat, please. Um, starting my speech in three, two, one. So there are two broad issues in top half, and we're just going to win both of them. That's going to be CG strategy. So the first issue is just generally societal benefits, like where do we reduce inequality? And the second is just where are children better off? So first of all, societal benefits. So as the opening identifies, the parents you are born with affect your lot in life by a great deal. Race, socioeconomic class, their skill at raising you, and the beliefs that are ingrained into you in childhood. Now, they say on opening opposition that the norms remain the same, even if parents have, by origin, different ideologies. We think that by putting parents into the same group and by having them in the same place, you force them to mediate these different ideologies. Like people are still going to have different beliefs when it comes to raising children on either side. We think the distinction is their participation in a communal raising group is one that drastically reduces the consequences of inequality. How does this motion do that? In four key ways. First, by hypothesis, your birth parent no longer solely determines your social status. Resources are more diffusely spread out and the birth child of a mayor no longer enjoys a disproportionate amount of resources in terms of education and ingrained arrogance. On, go, on op, they say in response to OG that a small group of white people control the resources and thus the maintenance of social norms remains unequal on their side. However, the problem is that this argument that the one that we're introducing in closing government is prior to the white group of people controlling these norms in the first place because you reduce the incentive for them to group up together in the first place. Like there's no more reason for them to want to keep it in the bloodline and the family if they no longer hold this massive importance on the, on the bloodline and on the family in the first place. If it is the case that they see other people who are raised with them in the same community as part of their in-group. Secondly, we also think that you massively decrease the closed-mindedness of the average individual. You widen the vistas of the average individual, of the average person, where your parents no longer have sole control over who you come into contact with, because not only do they have to negotiate this with other parents who act as sources of authority themselves and like make it harder for you to justify your racist, bigoted beliefs when enjoining them to do certain things, but they're also forced to interact with other races, particularly in other communities or particularly within their own communities. So like they have to act, they have to talk to like the child because they live with them. They have to talk to this child that they don't like because of the fact that they'll be staying up with them for the rest of their life. Thirdly, we also think that you substantially reduce the strength of these social norms and this programming. OO says that these norms will massively entrap you and that also you trust less people. We think this is genuinely a good thing because at a face level, since you have less time to entrap people into your ideology, whereby you can leverage this trust to make them believe, even if you have an illogical ideology, the alternative on our side is that Pair, you can compare and contrast the different beliefs and norms that parents are trying to bring down onto you, which we think, generally speaking, is a good thing because it means that children are best able to pick for themselves what ideology and spiritual beliefs best fit their lives. Fourthly, why is this then outframe opening government's material on this? The first thing is because suffering is relative. Your sorrow over your lot in life is determined by how much you feel and deserve. So even if, like, I don't know, they have marginally more, like, benefit or, like, I guess, happiness from their parent, right, or skill in being raised by their parents. We think this outframes that point by simply making it such that individuals feel substantially less inequality and are substantially less aggrieved over their station in life. It means that they feel far less existential dread over how they feel about other things for the reason that, as we explain, the suffering you feel in life stems from the relative inequality that you feel. Note that this also frames outframes opening opposition's points in two ways. The first is it outframes their point on widespread norms, because while these norms happen to exist in both societies and are diffused in both societies, since both societies will still have schools, will still have a government that enforces certain laws and still have a police force that will, that will enforce Jim Crow laws, it is our side that 
changes who gets to participate within this in-group. The distinction is now who the norm considers to be within this in-group. The second is on the point on like minorities, in particular the point on women. We think that note this happens still on your side, where like families still offload the responsibility onto maids or into helpers or into like other people, right? Or even to the daughter. But we think the difference on our side is that you have considerably more collective bargaining power in the group. Where if you are a woman who feels the need to stand up for herself, you have other people to ally yourself with inside the family, where you have other people that you can talk with and other people that you can collectivize with and generally form a greater force. Whereas if you are in a single family unit, you are alone and have no one to help you with because family business is private. I'll take oh, oh go. So white men who you concede would have run these communities historically have no incentive to democratize forms of power based on biases about who is most likely to be successful, and they just don't want other people to challenge them. What this means is that you're not going to equitably invest, but invest in people who are most proximate to you and who you're able to relate to best. Great. Closing opposition. Thank you, Pilaina. Given that individuals are still selfish and kids require a lot of resources, there is no reason to believe that they can similarly access things like hobbies or education on your side of the house because it would require people who are not close to them to advocate on their behalf. The response to the first one is that it's begging the question. You're assuming that white people are in charge on both sides. The response you gave is that this is prior to that. There's no reason to believe on our side that would be the case, where on your side you could believe that to be the case. The response to the second point is going to be done in the second argument. Second argument, we also, this, we believe, that, we also believe that this substantially improves the net quality of life for the average individual. First, it means that there's less abuse. So obviously, this is the same impact as opening government. How do we do this better? So their side has the like a soft incentive, which is like the entire community feels at stake and parents no longer feel like they own the kid, which are soft incentives. And while I don't think OO beats this, they do rightly point out that this is not mutually exclusive, that communities have bad incentives on both sides and communities make it like want to cover stuff up on both sides. What our argument will do is explain why it make it becomes harder to cover up and uh, harder to cover up and like hide the consequences of abuse, even if they have the incentive to. So it's harder to do abusive things, even if you wanted to on both sides. First is because since you are in a communal setting, it means that when parents do shitty things to their kids, they have to justify them to other parents. When they say problematic things, or when you beat your kid, it means that there's a substantially higher risk of another person asking what what you want to do, what, what you're doing, and it means it's significantly more likely for them to report it to other individuals. The second thing is that there's a game theory fear for abusers, which is that it only takes a single person to report you only one child to rat you out. And as such, they become substantially more hesitant to do bad things in the first place, which means that the amount of deterrence increases. Secondly, we also generally think parents are better at raising kids. The first is that individual parents have a substantially lesser investment in their kid, which while counterintuitive actually is a great thing for the average parent. It means that they're far less stressed. It means that the burden of raising an individual child is far less, not just fiscally as what open government says, since I think O'Reilly rightly points out, again, there are probably community uh, measures of, for communities to distribute these resources and make things easier on parents. It is the actual burden on a parent itself like raising a kid can be shitty and abusive at times a child can say hurtful things keep you up on for days on end and make you doubt your ability both as a parent and as a person this is a massive benefit for parents but also a massive benefit for children who no longer have to fear experience overworked overburdened parents that hate them and grow resentful towards them on weighing then why is this more important than even O's point on trust the first is that their point on increased marginal trust doesn't actually do much like first of all what happens if your parents are unavailable and simply not in the position to be confided in but secondly what happens if you need different kinds of trust if you need to confide in a parent that doesn't shout at you but you've got oh, like the two ones you've got still shout at you right so you can't you have nowhere to go we think the the diffusion of this trust might mean that there's less benefit for each individual parents but it also means that in situations where children face massive amounts of abuse the harm is massively cut off additionally we also think that you massively amplify the benefits towards children in the first place so we think that their benefits exist when parents are good but in most cases as we structurally establish parents are unlikely to be good at the end of the speech we do two very very important things the first is we take it over top half and the second thing we do is we argue so much CEO is out of the round. So for these reasons, affirm. Thanks. Thank you for that fine speech, member. Off the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. PY is in the chat, please. Starting in three, two, one. An enormous number of impacts in this round are contingent on parents actually wanting to do good for their children and putting in effort to like do good things for their children. What I mean by this is that OG may be correct that in their world, parents are like better positioned to uh, provide children with emotional support by being able to go to a bunch of different people, for example. But if we can prove that that's unlikely to happen because parents just don't have the incentive to do that and would not want to, then we can outframe their benefits. Likewise, um, uh, with opening opposition, many of the benefits they describe of having uh, individual parents are again contingent on those parents wanting to and having an incentive to do a good job. Therefore, 
the reason CEO is going to win this debate is that we're going to be the first team in this round to analyze what the incentives of parents are on either side of the house based on how they frame and see their responsibilities. And that's going to explain why children get more emotional support on our side of the house, as well as a host of other benefits that everyone in the round has been trying to claim. That will be our extension. That will be why we win. But before I do that, I just want to do some extraneous rebuttal to CG's weird extension about uh, like reducing inequality. The other part of CG's extension about uh, less abuse, that will be integrated. But I do want to directly respond to the point about inequality. So I just think it is weird to say that uh, like this is prior to like white people controlling all the resources, which is basically like their response to OO correctly, uh, by the way, pointing out in a POI that like uh, 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 that like it would still be the case that white people control all the resources. Like I, I, I just don't think that what this motion consists of is like like literally like the entire city like ra all raising their children together. Like I just don't think it's the case that there would be much of a reason that like rich people and poor people would be in like the same communal block raising children together. I think that privileged people like to protect their resources because it allows them to protect their privilege and to protect their position of power. Whereas like if you raise a bunch of kids in a fairly egalitarian way, those kids are more able to grow up and compete with you. What I think this means is that the way people, like people would still have an incentive to form communities around like their own privilege and around not allowing that privilege to be accessed by other groups of people. Um, and, and so like it is probably likely to just be fairly small communities. Like as an intuition pump for this, I'll point out that the nuclear family is actually like a fairly recent innovation in society and children were raised in a fairly communal way for most of human history. But I doubt that OCG would be willing to say that uh, before, like, uh, you know, like the in 19th century, that things were fairly egalitarian. I think that flies in the face of our intuitions. OK, so let's talk about uh, our extension. Basically, what our extension is, is that in Gov's world, parents would always be passing the buck on to someone else. That there would be no one whose clear responsibility it is to take care of the children. And that this creates enormous problems for making sure that everyone is accounted for. So um, OO talks, uh, so uh, just to like more clearly out frame top half, like OO talks about having worse relationships with your kids uh, because you spend less time with them. I think Gov reasonably responds to this by saying that there would be different norms about how much time needs to be spent in order to form a meaningful relationship. I think the real mech that describes why it is in fact the case that children would feel less support from the adults in their lives is about how collective responsibility is imagined. Because what this is, is everyone has a vague responsibility to take care of the kids, but that responsibility is never like clearly elucidated. It is very difficult to come up with a clear bright line as to where you have or haven't done your responsibility to the community. And it means that people can get away with like vaguely gesturing toward being responsible to their community. You know, maybe they like, uh, you know, have, I, I have trouble picturing exactly how this would look, but like maybe you have like a few kids that uh, like sleep with you sometimes, maybe you, you like feed some of them sometimes, but it's very hard to check on each individual person in the community. Like, are you being supportive to this child? Like which child like feels like they can go to this adult in their life? Which child doesn't have any adult and needs extra help? Moreover, people are, have a kind of selfish incentive not to take responsibility when they don't have to, because as has been pointed out in top half, raising a child is a lot of work and people People don't want to do that work if they don't have to. So at the point where you can always assume, oh, someone else will take care of it. And when you always have plausible deniability because you can do some, but maybe not as much as I, as would be ideal, parents are just not going to do very much to take care of their kids. In, the con in our world, however, it is extremely clear that if you don't take care of your biological children, nobody else will. And so you feel a pressure, both a social pressure from society and a moral pressure because you love your kids to take care of them and to be that supportive force in their lives. So uh, let's talk about what this means in Gov's world. Uh, but before I get into the impacts, I'll take OG. Okay, I'll take CG. So I just want to point out, OO rebuts this when they say that the biological process forces parents to feel attached to their kids independent of time spent. What? How, how does that? I, I really didn't understand that POI, sorry. Um, Okay, uh, apparently Emery will respond to it if uh, OG also thinks it's good. Anyway, so let's talk about what this means in Gov's world. Uh, I think this means several things. Um, I think firstly, this means that uh, kids who need extra support in any way, whether they're like doing badly in school, whether they need emotional support, don't get that extra support because there's no one whose job it clearly is to provide it for them. Secondly, I flip. I think this flips the point about abuse because like what abuse uh, often requires, uh, like what stopping abuse often requires is someone looking out for that kid, asking what's going on in your life 
like, are things okay? In their world, if one person wants to abuse a child, there's no one whose job it is clearly to protect that child. There's no one who has an incentive to be looking out for that child and to make sure they're okay. Given that OO has said some good things, I think, about how communities tend to normalize abuse and how it tends to be seen as okay within communities, I think that there is nothing to stop that abuse uh, in Gov's world. Uh, and now I'll take a POI from OG. Yeah, the argument of family tribalism that Shiji repeats defeats this because it illustrates why you're less likely to feel like your time specifically belongs only to your family and why you are under a greater sense of community obligation to provide more assistance and community obligations are meant to overcome this exact kind of collective action problem. Yeah, I don't doubt that there will be community pressure. What I doubt is that it will be enough to provide the kind of adequate support that kids need because there will be pressure to do something, but there is no clear point where you can say, yes, I have definitely done enough. And there, and like if there is a situation where kids in general are neglected, there's no one person whose fault that is, meaning that there's no one person who would ever really feel a need to take responsibility for it. I just don't think that tribal pressure where everyone feels some responsibility is enough to get this to happen. Okay, so what else does this mean? I think that in their world, kids will go to each other for emotional support more than the adults in their life because the adults have a collective action problem where they can all get away with being neglectful. I think this is a problem because kids are cruel to each other and not emotionally equipped to support each other. And kids often really like punish kids who don't follow in with norms, meaning that this is another mechanism I think is stronger than OOs for how we get more enforcement of norms on our side of the house because there's no one to oppose those norms and it is the entire community who is enforcing them. And finally, I just think it means that there is less attention attention put into kids on net, meaning that there is less focus on like putting the kids through college, less focus on creating generally good conditions for their kids, for example, less conditions, uh, less attention on advocating for them in the school system, because there's no one person who cares a ton. I'm very proud to oppose. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Thank you for that fine speech. Now to summarize the case on site government, Gov Whip, the floor is yours. Here, here. Um, hello, that's your microphone. Can I be heard? Yep. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, prefer Jennifer on team today. If you have any POIs, you can raise it in the chat. I'll watch the chat for all of your POIs. All right. Starting my speech in three, two, one, and go. So this is a debate about reimagining the institution of the family. Families today promote inequality in many ways, through political dynasties in public, through economic structures and oligopolies, and through cultural obligations and absolute authority. What we do at Closing Government is not just repeat the tribalism argument of OG, is that we uniquely talk about the social structures that can significantly be improved to reduce inequality even before it can try and spiral and exacerbate in the future. That is the argument we provided to you. It was not rebutted by the previous speaker. They just say we don't have an obligation. We give you many reasons as to why this obligation exists, and I'll go into them right now. So firstly, I'm going to focus on the incentives for parenting, why the incentives are inherent, and why it's going to be better in our world to rebut CO. And second, I'm going to talk about what is this world likely to look like and just add some imagination to this debate. Number one, on the incentives for parenting. So again, CO suffers from a lack of imagination for what this world would look like and how it's going to be better. So because CO says they don't have responsibility, they don't have capacity, they're going to be lazy, they're just going to pass the buck to other people, they won't care. And they say that most of these parents will continuously do this over and over again to the point that no child gets taken care of and the child will just cry. We simply say that there's so many reasons for people, if they are lazy, to try and invest in these structures so that they can reduce the marginal cost for themselves. They will want to hire, for example, many daycare, daycare centers because they know that more and more children in the future, if this person has another baby, that person can just go to the daycare center instead of having me to go to every single house and spend two hours of my day having to babysit for every single one of these families. Or for example, you don't want to invest in many public and private organizations to also enter into your community so that they can also invest in the ability to improve the schooling, make more teachers to spend time with taking care of many of these children, or just having more beds for many of these children to be living in so that they can have more interactions with another. So, you know, because if more children are pooled in one area, like it's one parent, the marginal cost, it's so much easier for all of them to do that. So there are many selfish reasons for parents to opt into these structures. Number one, you may, as opening opposition says, which closing opposition also contradicts, you want your child to have a good life. So you will invest in other 
other children as well. It's quid pro quo because you have a biological incentive or a biological necessity and attachment that opening opposition talks about. Presumably, if that baby came out of your womb, you probably still have some biological attachment, but the norm is also communitarian to a certain extent. So therefore, you also have some relationships with other people and other mothers. Number two, you want to have a good reputation in society. So therefore, you probably also want to be you know, praised in the community. You want to be known as a really good child care and someone who gives really, really good advice. And therefore, that's also symmetric, but also even better in our model when it is actually in the public and also publicized and also transparent. But number three, you were raised by society in the past in this manner, and therefore you will also want to do the same. This obligation is different because when opposition says that, oh, no, 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 you can just do that on your own because you, you know, it's, it's your child and you'll take care of the child all the time. The reason as to why this is different is their model on relying on parenting and the good benefits they get from reputation also relies on them doing and being a good parent out in the public. And that is actually even worse because it ties to David's argument that the unique difference of having to publicly display your ability to take care of the community and other children's children and other parents' children, etc. This is a better way to reduce abuse and make parenting more transparent, more discursive, and more communitarian and more and more and more interactive and engaging. This is is the unique de bit difference we have in our model and that's why it's just it's just better um i'll take oo so we prove that kids are more scared of challenging community-based norms in a world where that would result in retaliation from, from a wider number of people. Even if you win the abuse clash, which we flip when we talk about cover-ups, it's far more important that you get certain white families in Jim Crow America actually challenging Jim Crow that will empower a larger number of people in the future. Okay, okay. So I want to operate in this worst case, even if there are poor communities in certain areas and there are richer privileged communities in other areas what we do is that even if the absolute differences of inequality will still remain the relative inequalities within these communities are much more significantly likely to be reinvested in for example the mayor example we talked about is that there are certain privileged black people in certain black communities that want to leave, conduct in Britain and lead to certain consequences like brain drain to the community that lead to a spiraling poverty cycle in many of these areas for other people. What we do is that because of a communitarian incentive that happens beforehand, the reinvestment in these communities for all children make it easier for the relative inequality to be reduced. Closing up, let's go. Yeah. Okay, you could like spend a bunch of money of your own money on sending kids to daycare, or you could not spend that money and pass the buck on to someone else. There's no reason why you would invest these things when it's not in these things when it's not your clear responsibility yeah, but, to do so. But you have a child. You want the child to be taken care of. That's reliant on you being able to have other people also invest in that as well for your family and for other children's families so that it's much more easier to do that. So OG fiat's this. We give reasons as to why this works. So we're better than OG. Firstly, why is this working? World better? What is this world going to look like? So what's mutually exclusive? While OG explains that this is a matter of norms and obligations, again, the soft incentives they talk about, to reach out to more children as opposed to succumbing to competition incentives that lead to spiraling inequalities between people, we said that this structure or parenting uniquely improves social structures and services that exist in these communities. Number one, there's more political will to pool resources with each other to reinvest in schools, hospitals, as opposed to the brain drain that's experienced in many of these places. See, for example, the POI that are given to the, to the previous speaker, which the relative inequality Quality exacerbates in these places, so more investment in daycare centers, more public reinvestment in reproductive healthcare systems. Because previously, right, you're reliant on maternity leave or paternity leave or having to try and give up your work. Now it's much more easier for you to give that burden to other people. Because assuming CEO is correct that you want to give that burden to other people, you also want to relieve that pressure on yourself as well in the pressures of taking care of other people at the same time. So at some point, there's a compromise. At some point, there's a concession, and that's why it's better for more people. But number two, there's more pressure to redistribute. Health wealth preemptively within these communities against other families. So, you know, there are a lot of families. They can compete against the few rich families in these places, and therefore the political will and pressure for them to do so is much more easier for them as opposed to one family having to leave and go to another white community where they're going to be relatively unequal compared to other people, and therefore they will suffer. So they have to compromise with these communities that they are part of. But lastly, there's a stronger ability to publicly contest and criticize these societal structures from the get-go when everyone is already going through the same experiences with each other. A demonstration of this, you will hardly 
argue with each other. You'll say your parenting is wrong. Your you way you raise that religion, you communicate that religion is also wrong. And therefore, you will public criticism also relies on your reputation to a certain extent for it to be regulated. To the extent that inequality and indoctrination exists on both sides, it is a matter of agency. We provide it to most children, and that's why our world is fairer and more in, uh, equal for more people and egalitarian. For all this and more, very proud of both. Thank you for that fine speech. Now to summarize the case on side opposition and indeed conclude the whole debate off with, the floor is yours, Rahim. All right, um, I'll take POIs in the chat, please. Starting in three, two, one. I think the clearest conception of what this world actually looks like uh, is actually in Gwen's speech, because I don't think what actually matters when you are parenting a child or making sure that they're going to grow up to be a healthy, safe adult isn't that you trust someone or that your community can give you good values. It's how many resources are actually going to be going towards that child to make sure that they have access to education, to healthcare, to daycare, that they have somewhere to turn when really bad things do happen to them. That doesn't happen at all on either team on government. I think what Gwen told you uniquely and what matters most in this debate is actually what parenting looks like. Parenting takes a massive amount of dedication of financial and emotional resources. I think what changes on government side is that these are not things that people inherently want to give up. What we uniquely have on side opposition is the narrative that says you as a parent are specifically responsible and specifically the person who is going to be held accountable if your child is not succeeding. What that does is actually ensure that kids who you know are inherently a vulnerable group by virtue of the fact they cannot advocate in the same way are actually going to be taken care of in the majority of instances that should weigh quite clearly above all other teams in this debate. What actually changes, I think, when you say that children are supposed to be raised by the community is that you lose the narrative that says no individuals are meant to be held accountable for these kind of things. This isn't a contradiction with what opening opposition said, despite what you hear from government. Some people do care about their kids, some people don't. This is just a fact, I think, in the status quo. Some individuals take on the biological imperative or whatever to say, I want to care about these children. The fact of the matter is, though, on, on government side, there is something that is going to actively cut against that when this is the uh, main thing that's happening. Kids are viewed as being something that should be raised communally. I think here's the intuition pump beyond uh, for this. In the status quo, people do have children. They do think that they want to take care of those kids, but they still do a really bad job of taking care of them because it takes some degree of you losing your own selfish uh, concerns in order to do that. It looks like you prioritizing driving that kid to daycare instead of, you know, going to your job. It looks like you taking time rather than resting when you work a long day at work to actually interface with that child to give them advice that is important. These kind of things are very difficult for a lot of parents to do. They take time. It takes effort. There is no reason why everyone in the community is ever going to be adequately able to give that kind of quality of attention and care to children when there isn't a responsibility that says no you actually have to do this or you are failing as an individual this is what Gwen means when she says you pass the buck on to other people what we failed to hear from either team on government is why even if they're giving you more advice or even if people slightly care more about having good health care these things are necessarily going to reach the same threshold that we have in the status quo for parents wanting to put their resources towards children to make sure that they're able and capable to succeed. That is what you lose out on on their side. Take a POI from CG. So I think this miss, this misses the material from CG, which is that the effort demanded from the individual parent also decreases. They can pull resources, take days off, and take shifts, which is simply not an option in closing opposition. Yeah, what you need to answer though is why when they can pull those resources, it means they're going to rededicate the time into the child, because what they're more likely to think is I can take this time off, other people can look out for this person, they're probably already getting their needs met, and you move on from believing that you should be held responsible for those things. Let's talk about CG's case though, and the rebuttal that they gave to us. The main thing that they say in response to Gwen's speech is that when you care, when you when there's a norm that says you're supposed to be taking care of children because the community values that, you care about your reputation, and that's why individuals who aren't the direct parents of these kids will still try to put time into these individuals. I think there are two things to say in response to this. First of all, wanting to take care of your reputation is not the same thing as the burden of shaping a child's mind and future. I think what this looks like is more shallow level advice, not actually ensuring that person is being taken care of, more like patting them on the head saying, you're going to be okay, sport, rather than actually doing the emotional labor that it actually takes. The second one is, is if this is the only reason that individuals opt into caregiving, either when they are the actual biological parent of a child or someone who's just in the community, this is never going to be equal care compared to what we get on our side, because it's youth saying, I need to do these 
these things so that I feel good rather than saying everyone believes that it is most important that I as an individual am vitally responsible for the well-being of this other life. That is far, far different than saying, well, everyone is kind of, you know, accountable for making sure that this kid turns out okay. So I, regardless of whether or not I'm the biological parent, do not need to do as much to ensure that that actually happens. I think, yes, it's true on our side of the house, and we can bite this bullet that government proposes, that some kids just do have, like, worse parents, and they're, like, born the lottery of birth into somewhere that's not going to take as much care of them. But the problem is that there is a norm already on our side, as Gwen tells you, where you can opt out and find other individuals in the community to talk to. You can do that still on their side. The problem is, though, you, in the vast majority of instances, people who do in the status quo have parents that are willing to take care of them, that's the world that we live in now, lose out on that. Given that most people do end up having those support resources, people who put them through college, who make sure that they're, like, taken care of for their after-school sports and hobbies or whatever, that's what they're missing out on, and just assuming the community is going to somehow rally all that symmetric resources to put towards these children. I don't think this happens ever in, the, in, in a comparative way to what we're getting here, given that the majority of people do have parents that are interested in their well-being on our side. That probably always matters more than the comparative that they bring you, which is maybe sometimes you get something like political will. Actually, yeah, responding to the political will point, I think given that the burden to other people means that you don't think that you need to care about all these individual children. I think what it looks like is you might say on their side, well, yes, we as a community value all of us taking care of the kids, but other people are going to do that already. I don't need to do that individually. You don't feel personally accountable to the same degree that they do on our side. I think in the status quo, we already has a norm that says you should prioritize the youth's development to make sure that they're going to be taken care of. That doesn't mean that in a lot of countries, you see a lot of money going towards education systems or healthcare already, even when they believe that you should be prioritizing healthcare because people are still inherently selfish, don't want to give up their tax dollars to go towards those kind of resources. That needed to prove that happened more on their side. Given we already care about kids, I think it would be happening in the status quo. I mean, they don't claim that from their world. Go ahead, OG. Individuals don't want to invest in children in the status quo because they have to do it all the time, even when it is exceedingly inconvenient. But you are able to prioritize who drives X child when it is maximally convenient for a given member of the community, which even means that when you're looking over a large number of children, it is on aggregate more convenient for these individuals because it is adjusted around their lives to a greater extent. Um, I just, it's okay. So what you're doing there is saying you as the parent now don't have to drive your kid to school as often. And that is somehow going to outweigh the development of a child who then is losing out on a parental figure who's actually going to be, you know, someone who is taking that drive to work and school and talking about the kids, talking about what's going on in the kid's life, making sure that they're actually being taken care of, providing that emotional support system. I don't understand why the convenience that they're, you're prioritizing in that PY outweighs the fact that people are just not going to be caring about the development as often. Let's respond to like the bulk of what they say though on government side. I think the broad point is basically you get more more advice sometimes because community members are like looking out for you. People already do that. I think we see a lot of queer kids are still able to find queer adults in their life, ask them for advice. No reason why we should trade off the fact that most kids do have their major support systems in their parents just so that more people are now giving one-off lines about like what you can do in terms of your future to be more happy. In regards to the abuse thing, I think it's just as largely symmetric at the point that parents aren't the only ones who propagate abuse. It happens just as often through authority figures like teachers or respected community members. That goes on still. The delta on their side though is there isn't a specific support network for that child to actually ask for advice because there's no one individual who thinks that they are responsible for making sure that person is taken care of, meaning the child is meant to find someone else on their own to actually ensure they have that support or they're more likely to be left in the dust. I think what we've done in this debate is prove to you that the most important thing is actually making sure someone's going to be accountable. That only happens in CO. Proud to oppose.